Now playing California Triathlon Soup. So welcome to the um, very first California Triathlon Soup, uh, which is a bi-weekly podcast that blends two-part triathlon, one-part culture, and a pinch of silliness. I'm Tom Richmond, the president of California Triathlon, and we are going to be uh, having as a guest today, Rocky Harris, who is the CEO of USA Triathlon. Welcome, Rocky. Thank you, Tom. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Well, I think um, as we were as we were going through this concept of having a podcast, there's lots of podcasts out there, and we we don't really want to redo. Uh, there's probably not a lot a lot of uh, new stuff out there, but you're new to the industry, and I think it would be great to hear a little bit about your background. Um, I will say this: we we do about three hours worth of research on you know as a precursor to doing these things, so. Um, you know, there's a little, you know, we've got a little bit of good background on you and, and try to get you, uh, m- get our membership a little bit more familiar with who you are. So, uh, with that stated, why not, uh, do you want to talk about, you know, just coming to USA triathlon where you came from? Yeah, sounds great. Uh, you may have done a lot of research, so hopefully I, I learned something from you about myself, <laughs> but what I, what I, uh, you know, I grew up in Tempe, Arizona, I went to ASU undergrad and uh, my, I grew up, my father is a, a high school coach or was for 40 years. And the, um, you know, I grew up with, with sport in my life. And, and that was just part of my, my everyday life. Um, and so it's just something I grew up with and around. And so when I went to grad school at University of San Francisco, I knew I wanted to specialize in sport management. And I was lucky enough to get a job with the San Francisco 49ers I uh, worked there in the communication department, really learned about the evolution and business of professional sports. Because when I got there, we didn't even have a sponsorship or marketing department. We we're really developing what is now uh, the, the, the strong uh, business within the NFL. And I was lucky to be on the ground floor of that. Um, I went from there to be the director of communications for the Houston Texans a year after they started, started up. And that was a, also a really good experience for me because while the 49ers were a family-owned business, the Texans were really run like a business. Um, and they were very advanced. Actually, you know, when I was there, they were the third most profitable NFL team. Uh, and they were probably one of the least known brands because they were new. So I just learned a lot about the business there. But I was really yearning to learn more about the business of sport and business it really in general, um, rather than just communication and marketing and, and digital and uh, is what I'd focused on. So I was lucky enough to get an opportunity at our biggest uh, naming rights, our naming rights partner, Reliant Energy, which is now NRG. Um, and I ended up becoming the, uh, the director of sponsorships and marketing there, which essentially allowed me to take a work at a Fortune 500 company and learn from executives uh, really the nuances of business, how to measure uh, results in a business. And what it did is it allowed me, as I knew, I'd probably get into sports again to, uh, to take what I learned there and apply it to sport. Um, this big company called AEG was moving a soccer team from San Jose to Houston, a major league soccer team. And the president, Oliver Luck, uh, uh, started talking to me about opportunities there. Help, and I helped him fill out his staff because he had to create a new staff uh, within about a two-month period. Uh, about Fast forward about six months, and, and he hired me as his vice president. I got moved up to senior vice president and then chief marketing officer. And then uh, during that time, which I, I, we ended up building a soccer-specific stadium in downtown Houston, really good experience for me. Um, but at the same time, my, my mother, who I'm very close with, with uh, got leukemia. And so I kind of had to refocus my life from career to personal. And I decided at that point I wanted to move back home uh, with my wife to Tempe uh, to be near my family. And so, you know, I didn't move immediately back. I, I was kind of looking at opportunities because I still had the, the obligation of finishing the, the, the construction of the stadium. And during that time, uh, one of the, my former colleagues at the Texans became chief operating officer at Arizona State University. 
And he ended up hiring me uh, there, which was nice because I was able to come home. Um, over the years, I got I ended up getting promoted to uh, take his position as chief operating officer. And then five months ago, I got a call about the position at USA Triathlon. And, it, you know, I would have never thought I'd leave my hometown. Uh, I had really a dream job at my alma mater. Uh, but I really saw with the sport of triathlon that we needed to make some really significant changes with the way we were approaching it as a sport. Um, there was a lack of collaboration. There was uh, a lack of really unity within the sport. And everyone was just working uh, in, in their own, and moving in their own directions without really thinking about why we uh, exist in the first place and really why USA Triathlon exists is to grow the sport, uh, to serve the sport, and to better the sport. And uh, I felt like I uh, could, could help because I'm passionate about the sport. I'm an age grouper who cares about it. Uh, and I thought that the sport needed somebody to come in and come with new ideas. And because of my you know, diverse business background, I thought I could bring some new ideas to the sport, but always putting the sport first um, and not USA Triathlon's business or the business of triathlon, but really the sport and the participants and making sure their experiences were first class so we could you know, continue to advance the sport. You know, our sport's going nowhere. It's not a trend. It's a it's, it's a sport that's going to be here for the test of time. It's going to really, to me, be it, it, one of the most important endurance sports uh, around the world. It already is uh, for really the rest of my lifetime. And I just wanted to be a part of the, the change and a part of the improvement and um, get back to our roots of, of focusing on our constituents like race directors, clubs, coaches, and first and foremost, the, the participants. Uh, and I felt like we got a little bit away from our mission. And what it happened was it, it really created some some splinters and fractures within the industry that I hope to now mend. Now, as, as part of all those moves, um, um, you 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 you're married. You have a, you have a wife and and three daughters. Are we? Uh, are do they take uh, moving as well as uh, as you do? Yeah, you know, my uh, moving to. Tempe was was an easy move from from Houston, even though my wife's a Texan, and that was the challenge to take a Texan mm-hmm. out of Texas. Um, but she loves family, and you know, with my parents around, her sister lived in Tempe, uh, so that was uh, somewhat of an easy transition because it was really for uh, personal reasons, and, and she bought into that. I thought it was going to be really challenging to move from Phoenix to to Colorado Springs, where I live now, because we have so many roots there, so embedded with our families and friends and everything there. Um, but my wife fell in love with Colorado Springs immediately. Um, uh, my kids are young enough. They're seven, four and two to where this was really the right time to do it. My seven year old had a little challenges early on of, you know, missing her friends. But as soon as she got her own friends here, that, that changed immediately. And really the lifestyle here fits us. We were outdoors people. We both, you know, like endurance sport. Um, uh, we like the community, like having a, a small community around us, even though it's 500,000 people here. Um, there are small communities within uh, the city, and so we've really we really feel comfortable here. So that 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 makes it easy. I think if I was moving to like you know Tuscaloosa, Alabama, or something like that, it'd be a different story. <laughs> but I'm lucky enough to live in a place where we can really get everything we want out of the city. Well, you know, as as I was looking at um, Arizona State and uh, the you know if if I had looked 20 years ago, the first time when I looked up Arizona State, I said, boy, that's that's a party school. It used to be a party school. It was on all the top lists. And then recently, uh, last, you know, six, six, eight, ten 10 years, um, it's no longer a party school. That's changed. A lot of fraternities are, uh, that, you know, left or booted, uh, back in the day. Um, I don't think there's any Arizona school on any of the top party lists. Um, how has Arizona state changed? Because, it, it, you know, there's, there were, there were uh, off campus. There was the the lazy river. Um, I think there, there was the air, you know there was reports that Arizona State was bringing out a lazy river for their students. And it's like no, no, that's not an Arizona State project. It is close, and it's a pretty cool idea. Uh, and maybe that's something you'll bring over into triathlon. But um, how how has Arizona State changed since you, since you were there? Oh, uh, I mean, it's transformed, and it's really due to one thing and one thing only. Uh, they got. Uh, hired an innovative and transformational leader and, and President Dr. Crow maybe 15 years ago. And he came in with this big vision, uh, aspirational vision that nobody thought uh, was even possible. And so he put the mark well beyond what anyone what anyone thought was possible. And, and he's surpassed every goal that he set out for when he first started ASU. 
yes, she wanted to uh, make it not with the, you know, turn the image around from a party school to an academic institution. And he's doing that. Uh, we were the most innovative university in the country the last two years. But most importantly, he wanted to change the entire model of, of, of uh, academia in America from an exclusive, you're only uh, a good institution if you exclude people, the, the, more, the, the less people you let in, the better you are. And he flipped the model and said, we can be inclusive and big and the best at everything. And people were really kind of snickering at him around academia. You know, they liked everything to stay the same. And what he's done is he, we're, we're you know, the largest institution at ASU. We're also the most innovative and we have probably as many or more uh, top 25 programs as any institution in the country, including the law school, the business school. Um, and I, I, I taught for the sports law and business program. So, so, you know, I was, I was lucky enough to be a part of it, but he flipped the model entirely and he was able to attract the best, most talented researchers in the country, the most talented students. He's created an experience for everyone. There's an honors college. that's as good as Yale or Princeton within the, the, the largest institution, but there's also something for everyone there. And yes, I was, a, I was in a fraternity, Sid McKay, when I was at ASU, um, but he, he decided that he had to take drastic measures in order to, to change the, the direction the institution was going. And so I was lucky enough to learn a lot from uh, really that case study of what ASU did. And I hope to apply some of that to USA Triathlon that, you know, part of the way that I approach business is that I, I also like to try to look around the corner and see what's next and not do what everyone else is doing. And so I hope to bring some new ideas and I plan to to USA Triathlon that can really advance us and take us to places that we don't even think is so, possible. And, you know, we we've had a kind of a, a dip in participation over the last few years. Not not, you know, not drastic, but a, a dip. And, you know, I hope that uh, what we can do is, is, is look back at 2018 as a turning point and not because of me, but because the industry responded and said, look, we have to reinvent the experience for everyone in our sport. We have to make it more inclusive. We have to make it more inviting. You know, one of my goals is to make the sport the most welcoming sport in America, where if you want to try a triathlon, we are going to welcome you with open arms. We're going to roll out the red carpet. Uh, the experience for you, will, you'll be treated first class uh, and, and we'll create a community around you to uh, make sure you're successful. And so that's, you know, that's my vision for, for what we can do. At well, from an innovation point of view, um, please tell me, and you'll have to explain it to uh, at least the six listeners that'll be listening to this. Um, what? Um, well, my, mo my mom and dad will listen. So there's an extra two. Sweet. So we'll hit eight. We're up to almost <laughs> double digits. Um, but um, tell me you were involved with a ASU um, uh, innovation called the curtain of distraction. And um, if you... Uh, want me to go through what it is because I knew about it a long time ago uh, when it started and thought it was awesome. If you watch ESPN, it's great. Do you want to take people through the curtain of distraction, or should should I? Yeah, maybe you 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 lay the groundwork, and then I'll I'll tell you how we got to, to the point from idea to. to so uh, I think it, it you know you know at the basketball games uh, the, the basketball games you, you when an opposing player would be taking a shot and we'll, we'll put a link up on, on uh, connected to this and put on the website uh, so folks can see it. There would be a curtain, uh, a couple uh, rowdy young men, ladies back there with a curtain. And as the opposing person was taking a shot, the curtain would open and there would be a distraction. And one of the most viral ones that, that I had seen, um, and I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Maryland boy. So I, I, you know, love Michael Phelps was Michael Phelps coming out in a Speedo with uh, two guys next to him and uh, like seven gold medals around his neck. And sure enough, the the gentleman taking the free throws, you know, bricked both of them. Um, and it was hilarious. And, uh, and it's been done regularly. So, uh, you know, please fill me in on that because that's always been something that I thought was pretty funny. Yeah, it's actually, uh, I would say, uh, when, when our, our team is good now, when it wasn't as good, we had more fans coming to watch the curtain of distraction than we did the team at times, which was kind of sad, but also shows you how marketing and doing things differently can really draw new people into the sport. Uh, so yeah, I mean, the best ideas come from the ground up, uh, not the top down. And we had a, a group of students called the 942 crew who came to us with a concept of, hey, when the opposing team shooting free throws in the second half, we want to create this curtain experience where we can dance and dress up and act funny and try to distract them from shooting free throws. And we said, well, hey, why not? Let's try it. So we tried it and it really took off. Uh, we uh, were on, you know, been on ESPN in New York Times. There's actually been a scientific study done on it that 
uh, the percentage of, uh, of the, the free throw percentage of opposing teams in the second half, because we only do it in the second half compared to the first half, uh, goes down substantially. Uh, and so, yes, it's uh, it's one of those innovative things. But like, I, you know, the best ideas don't come from management or from leadership. Typically, they come from the people who who uh, who are on the ground and know what works. Um, so that was. Yeah. So the Michael Phelps one was great. But if you go to games that we'll have we used to have a real issue with fans staying till the second half. They'd come for the first half and then leave. Well, now uh, we have we had for a while there until we got good fans coming for the second half, which I thought was a testament to the uh, marketing and promotions. You rarely see that in sport, that a promotion is so engaging that it brings fans to the games. Um, but yeah, that was that's just a lot of fun. And I think that that's what you have to have in sports. So, you know, it, in triathlon, to, to bring it to our sport is, you know, we have to make triathlon fun and cool and 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 change the, the image of the, just this elitist uh, image where it's only the best uh, athletes and these very aggressive competitive people, which we need that. And we always will have that in our sport because I'm a type A person. I'm never going to not be competitive, but we also have to be more inclusive and open and fun and enjoyable for, for more recreational athletes. And I think that's what I also want to impress upon and implore upon people is that we're going to be a more open and inclusive sport and try to do everything we can to get more people into the sport. Well, hopefully, um, hopefully, you know, you decide where you want to put the curtain of distraction in the triathlon. I, I don't know if the bike leg is the right, is the right <laughs> place, but uh, I'll leave it to, to smarter yeah. folks than, than me. Yeah, luckily, uh, luckily, again, I, I, I likely will, will uh, most of our good ideas will come from our staff or from our members. You, you guys, so um, last week, um, um, you know, two parts triathlon, a little one part fun, and a and a and a pinch of silly. Um, last week, you announced a um, a time to try initiative, uh, which was a hundred thousand person uh, uh, impact. Did did you want to take the chance to talk about that and and how you were collaborating with the industry on that? Yeah, that'd be great. Um, it's, you know, like I said, that when you want change or improvement in an in industry or in a business, you have to set a target and a big target, not something incremental, but something really that will transform the, the industry. And so my second day on the job, I flew to Chattanooga and met with the CEO of Ironman, uh, Andrew Messick. And we really, uh, had alignment around what we wanted for the sport, uh, that we wanted to look at uh, bringing new participants to the sport. And of course, we want to keep the ones we have. We have to. And I think we, we do a decent job of that. But we want to bring new people on the sport, be more accepting and more inviting. And part of the issue is that uh, over time, Ironman has done such a great job branding that for the average person, they think a triathlon is an Ironman. And we have to get back to the basics here and get let people know that there are sprint triathlons, super sprints, indoor pool triathlons, reverse tries, that there's something for everyone and anyone can do them, uh, a triathlon with, with practice and with effort. And so we both committed that day to focus on bringing new participants to the sport, including promoting short course racing, local regional races, and not just Ironman races, not just becoming a member of USA Triathlon, but really focus on bringing new participants to the sport at the ground level. Um, but we, we knew, and this is the facts that it will not be a successful campaign if it's Ironman and USA triathlon alone. It's an industry wide initiative where we want everyone to play a part, everyone to contribute, everyone to be a part of it, to grow our sport. So it'll take, you know, our clubs and coaches and race directors, pushing it out to their constituents to refer a friend, get people into the sport, teach them how to, uh, to participate, to, eliminate some major barriers within our sport. The number one barrier for non-triathletes to get into our sport is the swim. It's 53%. And so we're going to, you know, have swim clinics and open up gyms where we can teach them. We're going to work with our coaches and clubs to accept and invite new people in uh, without having, you know, an upfront cost on it. So we're really going to look at the entire triathlon ecosystem, everything that touches triathlon and see how we can uh, impact this and get new people on our sport. Because the more people that participate, the better it is for the sport, the better it is for everyone's individual businesses. And quite frankly, the events are a lot more fun when they're, when they're filled out and they're, and they're at and you capacity. Do what you're doing as part um, of that so outreach to USA Swimming as well, right? Absolutely. I'm good friends with the CEO, Tim Hinchy. Uh, he's an innovative, forward-looking guy. He and I were hired around the same time. We both worked in Major League Soccer together. They have 400,000 youth uh, members. 
And there's nothing he would like more than to have them continue to swim after they're done with their youth clubs. And yeah, many of them will go on to master swimming, but many of them won't. And many of our members are master swimmers too. And so, you know, we're going to work together to try to create a pipeline from, you know, his youth participants uh, to get them to become triathletes. Because if they continue with the sport the rest of their lives, they're going to follow swimming and enjoy swimming and be fans of swimming the rest of their lives. So we all win. And I think sometimes we... We've isolated ourselves as a sport too much, and we have to open ourselves up now to, to new things. You know, we're also one of the best things that Ironman's doing is they're opening up, you know, they, they own the Rock and Roll Marathon series. They're opening up their races for us to, to, to booth at. They're going to open up their database for us to market to runners. So they're really, they understand that this is a time where we have to take some drastic actions. And what I've found is that everybody is, is getting involved. Um, and really what we look at this is an open source initiative where anyone can jump in. We're not uh, just partnering with our sponsors. We're not just partnering with those who we've worked with in the past. This is open to anyone who helps, who wants to help. Well, everybody grow. that, um, that I've had a chance to come upon or uh, you know, we've reached out to has, has said nothing uh, but good things about your involvement and that uh, your energy is infectious. So um, that, that is definitely on the plus side of the ledger. Um, in terms of the, uh, you mentioned database, um, you know, as you guys collect information data for these 100,000 folks to, to grow, um, who, have you thought about who has access to that data? Is that something that's being run by USA Triathlon? Is that something by USA Triathlon and, and Ironman as a co-initiative access to? What about um, third what about other race companies? Um, to, one of the points would be that uh, USAT has 4,300 events. In North America, Ironman has 102 events, which is about, I guess, 2.4% of the events. So will other race companies have access to this, have this, have a level playing field when it comes to that data? Yeah. So we're USA triathlon manages the data like we do with all data. And, and the way that we're, we're changing our entire model for the re, the local races where we're going to do now uh, local and regional marketing for them on their behalf. We're going to promote their races to our entire database, not just the hundred thousand new um, in fact, on the website, my time to try, I want everyone to go look at it. Part of what's exciting there is we have local races in your area that are pre-populated based on where, you know, geo-targeted based on your location that shows you what upcoming races are there are. Um, but we're also going to do that through emails. Our, our, we're, re, we're right now redoing our entire system, our, our email and CRM system, to be able to promote upcoming races in everybody's areas based on where they live. So it's really going to be, and it's not just right, it's not just events. I think that's that's just one part of it. We're going to also promote um, the potential to uh, connect with a coach or join a club because um, we want to create a local community around everyone. So that way, uh, mi- most of the reason why. Uh, people leave sports or, or, or they leave, uh, you know, uh, things that their hobbies and other things is because they don't feel like they have the support around them. So we at USA triathlon are going to try to connect the dots. Um, but we, we've never done a good job of promoting local races. We just haven't. We've always said, well, we can't do it because then you're picking one versus the other. Well, now we're going to really focus on sanction, uh, those who sanction with us, which they all do that we promote them and that we get we connect both race race directors, coaches and clubs to each other so they can start working better together. And I think that that's really is the governing body where we can serve because we um, we're very objective. We don't have any reason to promote one versus another. We want everyone to win. And so I think that allows the industry to have comfort that, uh, you know, when, when, when we're promoting, we're promoting all of the races within a certain area and not just picking one favorite. Well, as, um, as Bob Babbitt would say, who's a, he's a good friend of California triathlon would say, that sounds like you're, you're doing the hard yards. Um, it's, it's not easy work. No, and it's, it's the right thing to do. And, you know, part of what we have to do is we have to build the infrastructure here at USA triathlon for long-term success and not focus on short-term wins uh, just to, just to uh, you know, reach a goal or some financial metric. I actually don't even, uh, the board here at USA Triathlon has committed to not making money over the next three years. We are actually going to invest every dollar we bring in back into the sport. And that is totally new way of doing things here. We've, we've been putting money away in a bank and that to me is not serving our sport. 
So we're going to reinvest our money. And one of the things that they invested in was cleaning up our data, uh, making sure that we have a, a database so we learn more about our, our participants so we can serve them better. If we know that they do certain types of races, if we know that they have certain needs, that we can help them. And I also want to create resources for them. I want to create you know, free coach on call type. And our staffs come up with all these ideas to, to better serve participants, to make it so as they go through and they feel like after doing one, they might not want to do another one, that we have the resources there to help them through it. Uh, you know, that's why my time to try the, the website, you know, my time to try .com was created. It actually allows you based on your skill level and the three disciplines to not have uh, personalized content. So if you're uh, an, uh, a beginner swimmer, an intermediate uh, cyclist and an advanced runner, we'll have content that is targeted just to your needs. We'll also have training plans that are targeted just to your needs. We have 27 different training plans and it's just right now for sprint because we're trying to get people to do short course racing to start. Um, that's based on where your deficit, where you're, where you're struggling, where you need help. And so, we, you know, we want to create resources. And to me, as a governing body, we, we need to have resources at a national level, but we really need to focus on what good ideas are happening in each community, which they are. There are some, I mean, every great idea is, is probably happening right now in some community at some race um, within some club. And so we need to extract those ideas and share them across. Well, the that, that brings up uh, in terms of governance, a, a good, a good point um, is about 110,000. Is that about the number of annual members? Yeah, a little more than that, but yeah, right. It, it, it fluctuates between 100 and 130. Okay, 000. and in terms of uh, the voting uh, for board and things like that, I had heard that last year there were 900. Is that is that the right number? 900 folks who. I, I don't. I don't even. I don't even know. But I know that the voting, as as in most of these um, entities, the participant people who are running for board seats, um, that tends to be their friends and others who who vote for them. I I actually. Um, only voted once because I knew the person. And that's, that tends to be the case. So, you know, there's, there's low participation uh, and engagement on voting for board seats. There's really high engagement around like click throughs, around when a we send emails, when actions need to be taken. Um, but that's, that's pretty typical. And it's kind of sad that, you know, even voting in America in general, it's like, you know, we, if we know somebody, if we feel like it directly impacts us, um, it's something that I, I do want to improve is either, uh, figure out how to get more engagement, more voting. So we have a more representative uh, board. Um, but I will say this about the board right now is they, you know, they're not out, you know, campaigning uh, as they probably should in more ways. Um, but we have the right makeup right now, the board, they are 100% dedicated to giving back and growing uh, the sport. And the self interests aren't there. I hear this from my colleagues around the other 50 plus uh, national governing bodies that they'll have this board member who's focused on this and that's all they care about and it's all they push. And this board member who only focuses on this and this is what they, and our board is like fully aligned around our strategic plan. And I know it's because they developed it, but that is so rare and I'm so lucky right now that I have that. Yeah, but you know, one thing I do want to look at is how do we increase participation, although it's not the really the most important metric for me uh, on uh, on board seats, because I do think we need a representative sample. Yeah, I, I think that it kind of, you know, we push that to to uh, our audience and, you, you know, two of the two things that I think might be helpful is when the magazine comes out, uh, that there's there's more coverage of that on the front page and more ways to vote, electronic, mail-in, all those different things. And then maybe in the fall, uh, when when the regions are out at these races where people can vote on site um, and increase that participation. I, I don't know if that's the um, I don't know if that's the the answer, but it, it would be good to get more participation. Yeah, I think, I think those those are good ideas, but I also think you know that you know. It, we only have so much time with each participant and member in terms of, you know, information we want sure. to send to them. I don't think for me and my top 10 list is who they select for board members, although it's really important for the direction. I'd much rather them focus on getting new people into the sport. And I know that and there's so many other things we want them to do, making sure they know about the races in their area. So it is it is something I, I like the idea of promoting it better within the magazine, having more ways to vote. And, I, and we'll look at that. 
But this is not something I, 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 I'll just be honest, and maybe the board won't be happy with me. It's not my top priority. I think we have so many other things we can do to serve our community. Um, having the right type of board members is important, the representative board members, but um, I don't want to spend too many time or resources focused on promoting, uh, you know, <laughs> um, voting for the board. Well, I, I get an electronic link to it. And when I get an electronic link yeah. from USAT, there's, there's, that comes kind of in the same channel and the same pipe as, you know, a, 50% discount on this or, or that. So it's, it's really hard to, 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 to suss that out. But uh, no, I agree in terms of priorities. We are, um, we, we are, um, I, I mean, the last X number of years that um, our group's been working on, we're, we're singularly focused on making triathlon affordable, accessible, and sustainable. We had sustainable uh, last year because we had seen folks um, come into the sport, uh, put a long course bucket list on their their list and then be out of the sport just as quick and we were looking at something where somebody could be in there you know spend six to eight hours a week something where uh they could be in the sport eight to ten years to us that was a success story but under the affordable and accessible uh when we look at the average household income in the u.s it's about sixty thousand dollars uh, USAT at one point had quoted 126. I think you'd indicated maybe that gone up to 140. And then uh, WTC, uh, Ironman uh, Corporation, uh, quotes average household income of 247, $247,000, quarter of a million dollars, which is the top two, oh, top two percent. So, you know, for us, yeah. the simple, you know, we, we work to kind of take out those financial barriers um, to make this sport more accessible. And that's, we're, we're very, yep. you know, focused on that. That's, that's, that's a hundred percent of our focus. Um, have you put thoughts into, into making the sport more accessible, especially for beginners? Yeah, definitely. And that was, uh, that's something that we have a whole team. It's not just a, that's one part of the overall barriers. We have one team in our, in our, um, the uh, cross-functional team of uh, board members of our staff that, and others within the industry focused on uh, lowering those barriers, which cost is a major barrier, as you, as you indicated. Um, so, yeah, the, the, we're looking at how do we uh, create, you know, bike sharing programs, and, and, and you have that, right? How do we take some ideas from some of the, the, the groups like California Triathlon and others who've had success in it? Um, how do we work with, with race directors to, to lower that barrier? And I, I would like to create special incentives, special, like I said, being the most welcoming sport is for your first race uh, of figuring out a way to limit almost every barrier. I know that, you know, I was, I'm on, I was on the board of Leukemia and Lymphoma Society and with team and training is a perfect model. Um, they, you know, help you get a bike. They give you a coach. Uh, you, uh, you essentially fundraise to, uh, to be able to race and it gives it basically breaks down almost every barrier. It builds a community around you. They teach you how to swim. So how do we, as, as a governing body, take all of these good ideas? And it's really not for us to push down. It's for us to kind of get from the ground up. Um, and so yeah, we're looking at that. It's a, it's a really big important thing for us. Is we're basically have a team that's looking at each barrier and how we can we can lower those barriers to entry. Yeah, we have a uh, we have a program called called Sprint, which stands for uh, Swim, Pedal, Run, Intro, and Novice Team. Um, and any new athlete, first timer, sprint, Olympic, or even a select 70.3 race, 70.3 mile race, uh, they get training plan, a mentor, coaching support, monthly coaching support uh, from from guests, guests and things like that. And that's all free. Um, so, 100. yeah. So in information beyond the swim for people who don't participate, information, education, and not knowing what to do is number two. And so we, that's why, that's where the, the idea for my time mm -hmm. to try came is, you know, it connects you to coaches, it connects you to clubs. We give you a training plan. We give you content that's relevant to you. So all of those things are kind of just the start. It's not even, it's not where we need to finish, but it's a start of that, that breaking down that barrier of information, of knowledge, of feeling like you have the resources to be able to successfully complete your first triathlon. So yeah, that's, that's, you know, so it goes, it's swimming and then it's the, the information is, is a strong number two. Um, and so that, that's really, so we're kind of taking each of these barriers and trying to figure out, okay, how do we uh, break these down and make sure that people really, we aren't a part of the barrier anymore, that we're part of the solution. And so we're looking at every single one of them. And I know gear, uh, the cost of gear 
is a major, major, uh, you know, uh, barrier for people. So we're also looking at, I've, I met with many of our partners in the last two weeks about things that they can do to help first time triathletes get into the sport, um, to lower that barrier as well. And, and we're also looking at ourselves and looking at talking to race directors. We have a race director summit at the end of the month. We're going to talk to them about it. Um, it's really the, the 95% of our participants, uh, it's not even an issue with 5% of them. It is going to prevent them from doing our sport. And we have to do everything we can to to. to and you have a litany down. of programs uh, specifically targeted to women and increasing women, female participation in the sport. Yeah, so I mean, youth and women are really two of our our key target groups, and so are runners, um, because runners are the most likely to 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 become triathletes. Um, but really youth is our future. And I think we've done a disservice, although USA triathlon has invested millions and millions of dollars in, in growing youth and I actually made this call to action and really called out the industry that I get, you know, emails from race directors saying I'm no longer doing a youth event because it costs me money and I'm not making money. Although USA triathlon provides grants and other things to, to, you know, try to lower those barriers for race directors. And I basically said, look, you're, you're being very selfish. You're focused on yourself and your bottom line, which you should, but you're, you're missing out on the future and your future customers. And so youth is a big thing for us. Women are important. I mean, right now, and we're pretty darn lucky, we are at our highest percentage of participants for women in the history of our sport. We're at 40%. And, and that's because there's a lot of hard work done, but also because we've been very accepting and there's been communities built around the country. This is not done by USA Triathlon. This is done by women in communities or people in communities who care about the growth of the sport among women. And, you know, me with three daughters, the thing I care most about is giving women and young girls opportunities in sport. So I think because endurance sports and triathlon is a lifelong sport from the time you're, you're little all the way in, in, until you're old, you can, you can participate in them, that we have to do everything we can to be open and inclusive, especially with women. And, and, and that's an area that I think we can continue to improve on. I think we've, we've done well with women because the sport is, it, it has done well with women. I think USA triathlon now needs to step up and do an even better And that's job. where uh, this this uh, call takes an, an ugly turn. Um, we have to remember have two two parts triathlon and one part a little bit of fun. Um, in terms <laughs> of, um, I warn you, um, I read in a bio that um, speaking of appealing to ladies, that um, were you in a hip hop dance group in middle school called Ladies Appeal? Is that true? I know Isn't that kind of scary. Yeah. So when I was uh, when I was in, I went to an inner city uh, high school. And uh, part of like what we we did for fun is we did hip hop dancing. You know, there's rap and hip hop and, and kind of urban music was a part of my, my upbringing. And so we at our school had all these different dance groups and we would at, at the dances, you know, you'd have three or four, five different groups dance and then there'd be a winner. So our group was a dance and singing group. But I have such a terrible voice that I mostly just dance. Um, yeah. And so we were, uh, it's funny cause there's actually some, I have a picture of it when I was running for president of my eighth grade, I had a few of my friends and I, um, danced as part of my speech, which is pretty uh, do you, embarrassing. Do you still have that picture? Uh, but I have a photo. Yeah, I do have a photo. Actually. It's, it's, uh, it's, uh, I, I think would it's seventh love, or eighth I would grade. love to get a picture and put that in. Uh, it's in my year. It actually, it's in the yearbook of my, my eighth grade yearbook. So I'll have all my mom take a photo. Oh, of that would be amazing. So, so relative to that, um, you know, I had to do a little bit of research, you know, a little more research. So I, I saw, I don't know if you checked out Netflix, uh, hip hop evolution. Um, they have a really no, good not. series in that. So again, I've, no, I've heard about it from a lot of people. So are, are you it. like, can you, can you teach as part of, I mean, like triathlon could, instead of being, you know, swim, bike, run, maybe it could be swim, bike, hip hop. Like, could you, could you teach people how to like pop and lock it or? Yeah, no, I'm more, I'm more of like a, and I, I hate to use this vernacular because probably no one knows what it is, but you know, I did the, the running man, the Roger rabbit, Bart Simpson, all these old dances that were really, it was like right after the break can dancing you, era, you, the hip hop like dance era came in. I couldn't play. Yeah, I can do yeah, those, all, all those dance moves that, you know, and, but you know, now if you see me dance, my, I, I still think I'm a good dancer, but my wife tells me all the time that I lost it a long time ago. So <laughs> I, I can now officially say I'm retired from being even. Well, it's, dancer. it's, it's uh, funny when I, uh, when I, you know, was looking at the, uh, the hip hop evolution, I was like, Oh my goodness. Yeah. That song, that song. And it, it covered everything from, you know, Grandmaster Flash to uh, DJ Cool Herc and, you know, and then the Beastie Boys and then Run DMC and Aerosmith uh, with that transition. 
Um, but I think the thing that that got me the most um, in terms of timings was you had you know Ice T, uh, you know, and in, in, in the early '90s putting out some some pretty um, you know. Uh, uh, you know, uh, music that was definitely contentious. And then they, then you see him yep. on law and order SVU as a police officer. And you say, okay, some, something, something's gone wrong here. I, I don't, I, this, this is blowing my mind. <laughs> yeah. I think, you know, what I actually heard a podcast, uh, a Malcolm Gladwell co- uh, podcast in the last couple months about, uh, and I don't want to bore your listeners because this is not what the topic, you know, of the, oh, the conversation bore, really bore is. Them. But bore, bore all with, ten of them. With, what, they, what, they, what he talked about, which is interesting to me, is why country and rap and hip hop, um, you know, have such deep and kind of not, not disturbing, but, you know, uh, you know, uh, not just language, but the things they talk about are really kind of deep. It's just deep where rock and roll a lot of times is more surface level. And what his hypothesis was is because because of the subculture of, you know, urban hip hop or southern uh, country um, it, it, where rock and roll is really spread across the country and pretty broad is that they don't have to explain a lot of the nuances in, in rap or, or country. They can dig right to the issue without having to kind of set up the context or, where rock and roll really just talks more at a surface level for the most part. And he gave a few examples. And I really never thought about that until, until I heard that. And I think that's part of why, you know, rap historically or urban music historically has been somewhat offensive to some people. It's because that, that you know, the general population is typically not their audience. It's the people that are suffering or hurting from something. Same with, uh, you know, country stars as they, uh, you know, they grew up in rural areas and in and, and, you know, the southern parts of our country where they have different problems that people in big cities don't have. And so they're able to go right to the heart of the problem, which also means that they get deeper and they actually say things that maybe are a little bit edgier than than what most people in the general population well, would if, accept. If you so, like anyways, that are, that's, no, no, that's great. If, if you look, uh, if you like things that are, you know, made in America, then um, you'd have to look at jazz, baseball, and 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 hip hop, and uh, and certainly, I guess, I guess, would we include triathlon in that too? Absolutely, we would. Of course, we would. Yeah, uh, you know, made made in America sport. Um, you know, really, our in our our governing body it was created by race directors who really cared about the sport, wanted to see it grow, wanted some unity across the country. Um, but it is, uh, I mean, there there are other forms of multi sport that 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 were here before. Um, but uh, it is a sport that's made in America and grown in America. And by the way, we are by far the biggest player in the entire world. Um, we are the biggest membership group in the entire world by far in America. Um, so it's still the most popular uh, uh, in America versus all the other countries. And I think that we really um, should be proud of that. And, and we should really uh, continue to, to be the leader, and we will be. Um, and I believe that, that our, uh, with the, the ongoing uh, you know, overuse injuries with kids, with adults, um, there's no sport that I'd rather my kids get into than triathlon because of that. Um, it, while, you know, they focus on, uh, on three sports and being really good at them, they focus on three sports and not just one. And I think my dad was a PE teacher and a coach. And I think we've gotten away from, uh, you know, we've been so focused on getting our kids really good at one sport that it's really taken away from them being full and well-rounded athletes. I mean, PE classes around the country have been taken away over the last 20 years and removed from curriculum. Um, I just don't, I don't accept that. And I think that if you have your, your, you know, my kids, I don't want them just to be baseball players or just ballerinas or just this. I want them to learn all the sports. And I think that's why triathlon, we can really have a unique positioning within the sports landscape that we can offer you three sports while you're training for one instead of just so one. So one last question to wrap up uh, wrap up the, the time uh, and very much appreciate you making yourself uh, available is um, going back into the hip hop background. Uh, did you ever actually <laughs> look at, a, uh, at an 808, a, a drum machine? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. So, an 808 drum machine, um, you know, back in the day was um, one of the first programmable drum machines. So, the question is again, bringing this full circle, would you rather have an 808 drum machine or a pair of uh, Zip 808 carbon fiber wheels? 
Oh, carbon fiber wheels all the way. My mom, actually, when I was a kid, I had one and I was a drummer too. She made me quit uh, drumming. And I think she, she took the 808, uh, the adapter out. So it couldn't make noise. And it was just a pad because I made so much noise in the house. So, um, yeah, so definitely, uh, you know, anything with the endurance sport now, I'm, 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 I'm a big advocate for, I'm obsessed with. Um, it's a sport I'm passionate about and always have been. Uh, actually, you know, I was a cyclist before I became a triathlete. Uh, and so it's, uh, yeah. So now as I've, I've aged out of, uh, what I feel is like, you know, my, my, uh, my sweet spot with hip hop, I'm aging into what is your sweet spot within the endurance landscape. Cause I'm in my forties now. <laughs> so, um, but you know, before we, before we break this call and I know we've, we've had some fun at the end is the, the work you're doing, Tom, uh, in the mission focused work you're doing to grow our sport it has to be commended. And I hope to learn and take some of the great ideas that you've implemented over the years, shown, you know, record growth, uh, record engagement. And I hope to apply some of those ideas at USA Triathlon, as well as other people around the country who've had uh, really good ideas that really haven't been embraced yet by USA Triathlon. Uh, we are now uh, open uh, we are now flexible and we want these ideas to come from from all parts of our country and not think that in Colorado Springs, we have all the good ideas because that's not the way that the businesses grow and that's not the way that industry grows. And so I just want to thank you for all the work you're doing. I know that even this podcast is you committing your and volunteering your time. You do this for, uh, because you care. And we have a lot of people around the country who want to see the sport grow because they care. And I, those are the people I want to tap into because I care. And I hope that's come across in this podcast is that I'm passionate about the sport and I want the experience to be first class for everybody involved in it. I want to remove every barrier and I want to partner and collaborate with everyone in the industry to move us to a place we all know we can be in the future. Well, we, well that, those are, those are very kind words and, and I appreciate it. Um, well, I mean, I'm mostly sure uh, I, I did this. Uh, so we have uh, some 23 ounce uh, blue, uh, California triathlon soup mugs, um, that are, uh, I'm, I'm using one right now and I'm sending one to you and, and, uh, Sandra. And, uh, so that'll be, that'll be in your office later this week. I'm, I'm basically doing this, uh, not, not for free. I'm doing it for the mug. It's a really nice mug. <laughs> and Sandra's, by the way, if you didn't know, I'm sure no one, she's my assistant who pretty much, um, she's, I call her the boss cause she's almost my, you know, she's like my boss. Um, but she, I'm sure, made it really easy on you. She to was set great. This up. And thank you again. Well, um, we'll make sure, uh, again, you'll be able to find this um, the very first of season one, uh, which will be six episodes. Uh, and uh, with with our first first guest, the CEO of US, the new CEO of USAT, Rocky Harris, uh, that'll be up on February 1st. Um, we'll have some of those links. Maybe we'll even have that picture um, from, from back in the, the days of Ladies Appeal. Um, up there by then and then a bunch of different links that were referenced during during the call so Rocky thank you so much and good luck to you in 2018 thank you very much and let me give one last plug please go and visit mytimetotry.com to check it out and also if you have any ideas on how we can grow our sport email me directly uh, rocky.harris at usatriathlon.org um, there's, there's no bad ideas. Um, and I do read and respond to every email that comes my way. So please feel free. If you have ideas on how we can grow the sport, let me know. 